Welcome to the Reason live stream, which is pre-taped today because of some scheduling issues. I am Zach Weissmuller, joined by my colleague, Nick Gillespie, and Ian Vasquez, Vice President for International Studies at the Cato Institute, and one of the co-authors of the 2022 Human Freedom Index, a joint effort put out annually by the Cato and Fraser Institutes. Today, uh, we're talking about the state of human freedom in this post-COVID world. And part of the reason we're talking about that is because President Joe Biden has officially ended the national emergency around COVID. A lot of us thought it had been over for a while, but I guess it's official now. Uh, but before we get into that, let's have a flashback to a little over three years ago when Trump first declared the national emergency in March 2020. To unleash the full power of the federal government in this effort today, I am officially declaring a national emergency. Two very big words. The action I am taking will open up access to up to $50 billion of very importantly, very important and a large amount of money for states and territories and localities in our shared fight against this disease. Okay, so and now with quite little fanfare, this uh, the White House announced the bill in a one sentence statement saying HJ Resolution 7, which terminates the national emergency related to COVID-19 pandemic, has been signed into law by the president. What uh, how, how are we all feeling about the official end to the national emergency? Ian? Well, I think that, uh, as you said, many of us thought that that emergency ended a long time ago. So in a very, very real sense, I think Biden is just catching up to the rest of the country in this regard. I mean, most states moved on a long time ago uh, from the the restrictive measures that uh, were imposed by them. And remember that most of the restrictive measures were <clears throat> in the United States imposed uh, by the states and localities. And uh, those have been long gone. We've had uh, uh, most Americans, the vast majority of them, have immunity or uh, have been uh, vaccinated. So it doesn't pose the threat that it, that that it did early on when we didn't have that kind of information. So this is uh, uh, long past due. My uh, my main thoughts were, uh, you know, when you juxtapose Trump and then Biden, we're really going from strength to strength in presidents, <laughs> right? Uh, and I think Pence might have been blinking an SOS message uh, like a Vietnam POW uh, in that in that earlier clip uh, to uh, to uh, follow up on what Ian was saying. You know, it's clear that in many profound ways, uh, the states and localities certainly have moved on, not completely, but fully. I think people have more. But there's always this question. And I know we'll talk about this later when you have these massive events uh, and this this we could also be talking about the financial crisis. Uh, we could be talking about 9-11. We could be talking about the Red Scare in the 50s. Um, you, you don't know fully like, you know, the event is over and we seem to have moved on. But there's always these weird kind of tendrils that continue into the future um, and into the present that motivate a lot of um you know, that motivate a lot of policy or or attitudes um, that don't really become clear until much later into the future. And I worry about that a lot. Yeah. And just uh, at the state level here, th this is a map of the states that still have a public health emergency declaration in place. There's seven of them. One of them happens to be Texas, which uh, might be surprising to hear. But when you dig into it, it's because Texas has the state of emergency in place so that it can override local mask restrictions and vaccine uh, mandates and, and so forth. Um, so there's some still hanging on. I know my former state of California just rescinded theirs a, a couple weeks ago. And now Gavin Newsom's doing a, a tour around the country to talk about it. But um, yeah, this is uh, the the end of an era. And I guess we'll see, as you're saying, Nick, what what lingers. And, and that's kind of the, the topic 
uh, for today because um, Ian is one of the co-authors of the Human Freedom Index, which but actually before we get into that, maybe you could just explain to our audience what exactly that is. Sure. The, the Human Freedom Index is a global measurement of economic, personal, and civil freedoms around the world. And so what we do is we take uh, 83 distinct uh, measurements of freedom in areas ranging from the rule of law or safety and security or the size of government or freedom of speech, freedom of association, 12 big categories, but 83 uh, distinct indicators for 165 countries. And then we put the, that data together to come up with what we think is a reasonable picture of freedom, human freedom within countries and at a global level. And when we say freedom, uh, we have an idea of what we mean by that. Everybody has their own definition of freedom. George Bush did, uh, Hugo Chavez did, Al-Qaeda did, everybody yep. does. We we, by freedom, we mean the absence of coercive constraint, the idea that you can lead your life as you choose, as long as you respect the equal rights of others. And that's what we're measuring. And uh, and so it's really the first uh, serious systematic uh, measurement of broad human freedoms uh, for a big set of countries. Uh, and the data that we're using spans two decades now. So it's very useful to, to look at trends and freedom as well. Kim, before we go into what happened, uh, the most recent version um, goes through year uh, 2020, right? That's right. I mean, what yeah. one of the things that, that you find out when you start working on international data is that there's usually about a two year lag to be able yeah. to compare data. And so the latest data includes 2020, which of course is the pandemic year. And right. Is, and could you yeah. also, because what the first year that you published this was what, 2017? Is that right? So this is the, so this is the, our eighth uh, okay. edition. So it was 2015, but yeah. we've been adding data and adding back years as data becomes available as well. So now we have two decades of data. Can you just very quickly say, like going back 20 years, that uh, two, uh, until 2020 and we're you know we'll talk a lot about 2020 because that's like you know a big year but uh what you know is the arc of freedom bending towards uh light or dark uh you know up until 2020 what what was the general trajectory so what we see is with uh beginning in the year 2000 which is the the year for which we have complete data yeah. is uh human freedom being uh, high, relatively high, certainly compared to decades past by what we know, uh, right. and continuing on an upward trajectory up until uh, the year 2007, which is really the, the global high point of, of human freedom. That coincides mm -hmm. with uh, the financial the global financial crisis, which came the next year. And we see a steady decline of human freedom uh, up through 2019 and of course the big the and then time, everything you know freedom breaks out everywhere right yeah and then uh and then in 2000 in 2020 what we see is that just the f freedom falls off of a cliff so you see this steady de decline in personal and economic freedoms economic freedoms were fairly pronounced and then you see this huge drop uh in virtually every category of, of freedom that, that you can think of in the year 2000 setting back 2020 setting back uh the world wow. more than 20 years and so what, there what does that right mean now. i'm sorry, just like you know the difference between say 7.3 and 7.0 can you you know is that the difference between having a 95 and a 65 or is it the difference between you know a 95 and i'm um, thinking of you know cool tests a 95 and a 90. it's a big it's a big difference uh yeah. because um you know, the range of freedom in the world, <clears throat> we, we use a scale of, of zero to 10. The range mm -hmm. of freedom in the world is not zero to 10. The range of freedom is usually between four point something and nine, something like okay. that. And this is a global average. So it's taking into account um, uh, all North all Korea and yeah. Switzerland, right? We or, don't yeah. actually measure North Korea because we yeah. can't, the, the data doesn't exist, mm -hmm. but, but yes, we're talking, you're about pretty sure they're extreme. going to be in the bottom. Yeah, they're going to be in the bottom half, except that, except that one of the things that we noticed is that some of the countries that were already low, like very low, like Venezuela and so on, 
they were already pretty much rock bottom and um, they didn't, there's not much more for them to, to fall. Yeah. So the drops really were coming from uh, a lot of countries that were relatively free. I mean, countries all around the world saw drops, but we saw big drops in countries that uh, are used to a higher level of freedom. And th mm. typically what we see from one year to the next to the next is small movements in freedom in one direction or another. This is a very large movement for the entire world. And can you it's a, uh, it's a movement. Let me just it's a yeah. movement that that affected 94 percent of the world's po population. Wow. So that f from 2007 to 2019, you already had virtually 80 percent of the world's population seeing some decline in freedom and then from nine, 2019 to 220 94 percent of the world's population saw this dramatic decline can you put a little when you talk about <clears throat> personal freedom uh what what goes what are the the big parts of that indicator is that you know kind yeah. of like sexual freedom is it um freedom of movement uh is it freedom of expression what goes into that category we we have several several broad categories that we measure one of them is the rule of law so <clears throat> is there due process uh do people get tortured when when they're um you know arrested or t taken in by the authorities another one is security and safety if you live in a country <clears throat> where you're likely to be disappeared or even murdered on the street or or beaten up your human freedom is not that high uh, and there's a big variance in the world on, on those indicators. Freedom of movement is another one. Um, usually, uh, we haven't seen much in the way of, of movement from one year to the next in that indicator of freedom of, of movement. But this, this year, we saw a huge uh, 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 movement for, for obvious reasons. But what we're measuring there is freedom of movement within countries and freedom of movement uh, between countries in the sense of a country doesn't let you leave or it doesn't let you come back uh, to the country. And, and of course, in some countries, particularly uh, the Middle East and, and North Africa, um, this particularly affects women in a way that it doesn't affect men. And by the way, uh, we do have a measurement that takes into account differences in treatment of women and men on a lot of indicators uh, in this index. We measure freedom of religion, and that's kind of uh, self-explanatory, freedom of assembly, association, and what we call civil society. So mm -hmm. freedom of assembly and association are, are important, but it's also important to be able to set up a, a civil society organization, mm -hmm. whether it's the garden club or a political discussion club. And in a lot of countries, it's very difficult to do. Our friends, our libertarian friends in France uh, tell us that it's virtually impossible to set up a libertarian think tank uh, there. It's very difficult. And so we find surprising things there. Freedom of expression and information, where we look at all sorts of indicators, you know, the ability to, to have access to the Internet or international uh, information, just freedom, of, of press freedom, that kind of thing. Um, and then what we call uh, relationship uh, freedoms is um, uh, same sex, are same sex relationships legal or illegal? In a lot of mm -hmm. countries, they still are illegal. For some, in some cases, it's just for men. In some cases, it's for women. In some cases, for both. Um, what's the difference in treatment of women during uh, marriage or during or after a divorce? Um, what, what's the difference in their relationship uh, under the law with their children? Those are the kinds of things that that we measure uh, that fall under the category of personal and civil freedoms. So you just laid out uh, the several different categories of freedom that you measure that account for this giant drop off that we see in this graph in 2020. Could you dig a little bit into what were some of the policies worldwide? Yeah that caused this hit. Um, I've got, I pulled a page from your report here that shows some of these different categories. I mean, we see the, the largest declines are in movement as you uh, alluded to earlier, expression and um, trade and even, and religion is also on there. Were there, did you break down, you know, specific policies that caused this uh, or was, uh, you know, how much of it, I guess, the qu one question is how much of it was policy and how much of it was just kind of pure reaction to the pandemic since we're talking about the pandemic year here. 
Yeah, that's a good question because um, you might ask, well, but some of this had to take place as a response to the pandemic. Even if it wasn't policy, people aren't going to be moving around and, and so on. But what we're measuring there are re restrictions. And uh, for the most part, <clears throat> that's what we're that's what we're for the most part uh, mm -hmm. measuring. And the and the chart that you just showed shows a twenty year uh, movement uh, yeah. of these indicators, and um, and so freedom of movement. I think that was the one that that saw the biggest decline uh, over that period. But almost all of that decline occurred in the year twenty twenty, and right. for obvious reasons. I mean, you remember we we travel internationally came to a halt travel locally in many places came to a halt certainly in a lot of countries you couldn't even leave your house uh, you could you yeah. get in serious trouble so that was a big uh, a big hit freedom of expression did too i mean um what you could say about the pandemic or uh criticizing the government in many countries rich countries and poor countries democracies and non-democracies um was was restricted and what what uh, um, what media companies uh, and even big tech companies uh, could say came under scrutiny and under pressure um, in a way that was probably already happening, but uh, even more so because of heightened uh, tensions and e health concerns and so on. Um, freedom of association. We know that people were not allowed to gather. Uh, this was a big uh, a big issue, and uh, the rule of law came came under. Uh, uh, under pressure, and we see big falls in that uh, because a lot of these things were uh, um, uh, adapted or uh, uh, implemented in an arbitrary way, uh, favoring some uh, groups and disfavoring others. In, of course, in the less free countries, in the authoritarian countries, this was done in a, in a very random way to go after uh, dissidents or political opponents and so on. Whereas in more advanced countries, um, there there may be other reasons for that, political reasons, and maybe it, be, it was more subtle, but it still was happening, and that was denounced by human rights groups, um, including Human Rights Watch, and so on. This was not just a problem for a part of the world. This is a pro this is a problem that um, rich and poor countries, democracies and non democracies, uh, were facing to different differing degrees. And you talked about how. I mean, the, the real drop off came in more free countries. If you're in Venezuela, you're already pretty heavily restricted on a day to day thing. But I was thinking when you were talking about like freedom of assembly or whatnot, I remember reason running stories. I think it was in Mississippi of a church that was going to have a drive in, you know, religious ceremony where people stayed in their cars and parked in a lot, you know, and, and you know, kind of, you know, didn't get out of their car in a way it was, you know probably the best way to set up church in the future right you know where it's like you don't even have to get out of your car but they right. were banned they were banned from doing that and that's like in the u.s that's really fucked up in a way that in a country that is used to repression it's like okay well that's just sunday or saturday or whatever day we celebrate church on we're constrained um I think that's right. And that that was, you know, that kind of thing was the, probably uh, among the most shocking for, for Americans or for people who were used to uh, a good a high degree of freedom. We really haven't seen that kind of curtailment of freedom to that degree across such a wide uh, number of freedoms in the United States. And in, in, yeah, you'd in have to life. go back to like World War Two, really. I mean, probably but, where there was rationing as well as uh, curfews and, you know, restrictions on, on industrial inputs and things like that. Things were actually being diverted away from, you know, commercial activities into a war effort. And whatnot. Well, that's right. And not, you know, not even during the financial crisis, did we see a drop in freedom that was this as, as severe as this. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't want to give the impression that the, that the less free, more authoritarian countries didn't see a big drop in freedom. They did. In fact, mm -hmm. um, we have a, a chart in the book that that looks at which are the countries that most dropped in terms of freedom from the high point in 2007 through 2020. And the top 10 are all countries that were led by authoritarian regimes. But what I want to emphasize there is that that was an ongoing trend. And so what the pandemic did was was accelerate it, whereas 
in liberal democracies and freer countries, the trend was a slower trend. And then there was a big drop off in one year. So um, that's probably the, the, the difference in looking at uh, one year to the next versus uh, uh, what was going on. And I, I, I mean, it, it's, it's probably true to say that the pandemic accelerated uh, a number of trends that were already mm. happening in the world, including in, in rich countries. I think that the um, the freedom of speech issue, which was already coming under pressure in uh, liberal democracies, mm-hmm. um, came under more pressure. And, uh, you know, free speech advocates talk about a free speech recession that had already been going on in in the world and in develop in developed countries, and um, the pandemic accelerated that in, in rich countries as well. When you talk about rule of law being a, a major component of, of measuring freedom in a country, that was something that I observed and I guess experienced firsthand uh, in a way I never had before during this pandemic. I was living in California, Los Angeles during the time. And it seemed that so many of the rules that were coming down, because it was all done under an emergency order, there didn't have to be the same level of scrutiny by multiple levels of government. Um, And I've got an excerpt here that I'm going to play in just a second of an example that's uh, of that that was really striking to me was when the county of Los Angeles uh, banned all outdoor dining. This was in 2021. So this was after the the freedom uh, index, the latest freedom index report. But um, the answers that they were giving to people as to why this was justified were virtually non-existent. And uh, I'll just play the clip because you'll you'll hear the health director who had the power over this entire huge region that is, you know, as populated as many states. Um, it, it was kind of just like it came down to what she believed was the right thing without any checks or balance. On November 22nd, Los Angeles became the only county in America to ban outdoor dining this winter for a minimum of three weeks. This order could put out of business many California restaurants that were barely hanging on, some of which recently invested in retrofitting for exclusively outdoor dining. The worst part, according to critics, is that the public health agency issuing the order has provided no concrete evidence that outdoor dining is a significant source of COVID spread. I personally feel like we're being punished. LA Public Health Director Barbara Ferrer held an online press conference on November 23rd to discuss the order and estimates from the county's contact tracing that 10 to 15 percent of COVID transmissions are linked to dining experiences, though she hasn't clarified how many of those transmissions were attributed to outdoor dining at restaurants and declined to provide the underlying data when pressed by reporters. Given that you haven't identified an actual source of an outbreak being an outdoor dining. How do you rationalize the closure and how do you expect to measure whether it actually is accomplishing what you're hoping to accomplish? We know that places where people are gathering uh, without wearing their face coverings are places where transmission uh, is easiest and most likely. Um, But we will be, you know, as always, we'll watch our data it was always a kind of like, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, so my, my question is, when you're measuring the rule of law or, or trying to quantify that, what, what are you looking at? And, and how do you take things like states of emergency or states of exception into account when you're measuring that? So we're not, uh, the rule of law is very difficult to measure. It's not like measuring a tariff rate or, you know, the, the, the size of government, that, that kind of thing is, is difficult. So it's, it's based on what a lot of experts feel, but I think that we use measures that are reasonable. Um, but they're looking at the same indicators over time. And, um, And so the different indicators of rule of law that we look at are ones that have to do with contract, ones that have to do with private property uh, protection, uh, rule uh, due process type uh, indicators. And um, we're not uh, we're not making a a special measurement to take into account emergency measures, Mm -hmm. whether they're justified or not. 
um, what we're seeing is a decrease in the rule of law. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and part of uh, uh, the decrease in the rule of law, because it's really um, uh, partially a perceptions-based uh, indicator, more than, than, than many others, is do people think that the rules of the game are fair or are being imposed in an arbitrary way and, and so on? And actually, that matters in a free society. Mm -hmm. What the perception is of the rules of the game matters to be able to uphold um, the system of justice and other freedoms. So what we've seen is a deterioration during this time where I think you can make the case that there were a lot of arbitrary decisions being made. It's quite another question about uh, whether that was constitutional at the state level or even uh, at, at the federal level. But I think at least in the early parts of the pandemic, when we didn't have very much information about the spread or even about the, the disease, um, uh, courts were probably more... Uh, we're, we're probably more reluctant to impose uh, orders that overrode uh, what the democratic system was yeah. um, deciding. Yeah. I mean, by late, by middle and late 2021, <clears throat> we did have courts starting to smack down some of these governors and uh, right. mayors. This is a little montage of headlines in Michigan, Pennsylvania, California, all got federal rulings against some of their restrictions, which were deemed arbitrary, discriminating against certain categories without any you know, rational basis. The big one was obviously the Supreme Court smacking down uh, the OSHA mandate that was requiring private employers to either vaccinate or test their employees. So th it was a delayed, but there, there eventually was some sort of judicial intervention. I assume that uh, you know, in the, the future, uh, you know, human freedom index, that that will be a mark in favor of rule of law in the U.S., that, that there is, you know, still some checks and balances in play here. Yeah, I would I would expect that. Um, yeah. But again, you know, we we take the data and sometimes we, you know, we we, we might not agree totally with it, but we don't tamper with it. We take the data yeah. that third party sources uh, provide. Right. Can we uh, show, uh, Zach, could you show the just the, the chart that shows the decline in 2020 sure. again? Um, Ian, is this, uh, you know, oh, uh, it's the wrong one. in, um, yeah, that, I mean, first off, can you just very quickly, and I'm, I'm, what I'm thinking here is uh, the old Robert Higgs book, Crisis and Leviathan, which is kind of, uh, among other things, is a, a, a generalized theory of government power and the way that it grows. And that there, when there is a crisis, when there is a war, when there is an economic collapse, things like that, um, the government generally expands its power. And then after the crisis passes, there, you know, it doesn't completely revert back to where it was, except in very rare um, instances. And, you know, you, you mentioned in 2007 being the peak, I mean, the, the global financial crisis seemed to usher in an era of like a lessening of, uh, you know, of, of freedom, of human freedom overall. It climbs back a little bit. It starts going down. And then obviously COVID really hits. But my question, I guess, is broadly speaking, is this what you're, tr you know, what you're tracking is a kind of crisis and Leviathan mindset? And then you know, in general, and then what explains the ramp up between 2000 and 2007? Like, why was the globe getting freer? Um, was there, you know, what was going on where suddenly, you know, people, people had more freedom? Yeah, those are good questions. Um, Robert Higgs was mainly looking at the United States right. uh, when he made that, that study. And so it, it, this is a global chart that, that was up on the screen. And so I, I hesitate to make such a broad uh, statement about mm -hmm. so many di distinct countries are around the world. But I do think that the, that analysis still applies to the United States. If you look at a graph of freedom of the United States and particularly of economic freedom, um, what you see is after the financial crisis, a decline in freedom, that in economic freedom that was rather sharp, um, it lasted during a good part of, of the Obama administrations. But then at the end of the Obama administration, we see an uptick in economic freedom in the United States. You mm -hmm. know, some of the 
some of the uh, big spending came to an end as the country recovered and so on. And what, with with Trump coming into office, we saw that continue in the first uh, year or two. And then um, <clears throat> by the last part of his administration, we saw it come down. And uh, obviously in 2020, it really fell so off, what, of, off of a cliff. And, I, and maybe uh, I, I, I take your point that we don't want to generalize from the U.S. experience to all other countries. But in the U.S., when Bush became president in 2000 and, and the Republicans you know, ran the uh, Congress, both as the Congress, in Bush's two terms, not only did we have the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, but we also had effectively a 50% uh, uh, increase in the federal budget. Uh, Bill Clinton's last budget was around $2 trillion. By the time Bush left, it was like $4 trillion. Um, You know, how did, how, you know, was the, was kind of governmental spending and increases in regulation and uh, economically significant regulations, things that cost more than $100 million to implement, was that being offset by other forms of, freedom or no uh the the united states doesn't track uh if you look at the graph of freedom in the united states it doesn't look like the global the, the global graph mm -hmm. it didn't it wasn't increasing uh, uh okay. 2000 that's that's one of the worrisome things that that that, that we found because mm -hmm. you asked why is there this increase? It's because all sorts of other countries are still increasing their freedom uh, around the world. And not, not the United States. The United States is a very worrisome trend starting from around the year 2000 of a long term steady decline in freedom that then with the with the global financial yeah. crisis, it, 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 it accelerated. And um, <clears throat> and we especially see that beginning in the year 2000 in the economic freedom side of things because of exactly the kinds of things that, that you mentioned and out of the five different indicators in, in economic freedom the broad categories that we look at size of government the legal system and property rights sound money freedom to trade and regulation all of them saw notable drops during during this uh, period of time except that the rule of law indicator saw the biggest drop. It was a it was a very big drop, and that accelerated with the financial crisis. But that was already going on, and it really started uh, with the beginning of the Bush administration. And we think that that's due to a lot of things: um, the wars, the war on terror, uh, mm -hmm. the war on drugs, um, <clears throat> the weakening of private property rights in the United States with the Kelo decision over a decade ago. Um, I think that the financial crisis made things worse because there was a rise of crony capitalism, or at least what people perceived as crony capitalism, where, where uh, industries and, and in fact, particular companies close to power uh, got privileges uh, and massive amounts of bailouts, even though uh, that, that wasn't necessarily justified. And all of these things combined to, to, to weaken the rule of law because it's, it's arbitrary and at the very least it's perceived as such. And when you have the rules of the game not, uh, not viewed as, as fair, that's a real threat to other freedoms. But we did see other, uh, other areas of, of freedom like uh, government spending and uh, monetary policy and freedom to trade start to uh, start to go down as well. Um, and this, uh, accelerated during the financial crisis. It started to recover some, and with the pandemic, it it came down. Yep. Never did the United States recover its level of freedom that it had in the year 2000, um, when it when it used to rank uh, at the top. In the year 2000, the United States ranked sixth in our Human Freedom Index. It now ranks 23. So this 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 is it particularly yeah, do you want to show that chart uh yeah, just... here's, here's the ranking we've got uh switzerland new zealand estonia denmark ireland rounding out the top five and then you go down us at 23 below belgium and austria and the united kingdom uh pr pretty sad uh yeah. here, here's a here's a breakdown of the analysis of the united states uh, as you mentioned rule of law as a is it a meager 6.3 um movement 6.4 affected negatively by the pandemic of course size of government 6.8 what's our what are some of the immediate steps that 
should be taken to, you know, reverse these trends and, you know, get the U.S. at least back into the, the top 10 of, you know, freedom ranked countries? Well, I mean, th there's a lot that can be done on, in terms of economic freedom. We're way below in, in economic freedom than what we were in the year 2000. And that that's in terms of free trade, in terms of regulations, in terms of um, sound money. Uh, in, in every indicator, we're, we're below. And so all of those policies can, can be improved. The size of government is, is much larger today after Obama, after Trump, uh, during the Biden after Bush, right? Yeah, after I mean, Bush, it's just if, much larger than when Bush yeah. came in. If I may, in 2019, because this, you know, when we talk about the, the COVID exception, yeah. 2019 spending this was under Donald Trump uh, and it was a record at the time fe the federal budget spent four or federal government spent 4.4 trillion dollars in 2020 it spent 6.6 .6 trillion dollars in 2021 6.8 last year it went down to 6.3 slightly this year it's estimated to be 6.4 and this is you know this seems to vindicate the uh, the Higgs hypothesis of a yeah. kind of ratchet effect so, you know, it's gone down from 6.8%, but it's much closer to that than it is to 4.4, which was already insane compared to, you know, Bill Clinton uh, 20 years earlier. That's right. So I think that that that, that uh, hypothesis is still valid for the United States after these, these crises. And, um, you know, there were several crises during the Bush administration, which... Yeah, yeah. Uh, which which did help to increase government spending at a time, at least in his the, the first part of his administration, where the Republicans controlled both, you know, uh, right. the, the, the Congress and the executive. And um, that's oftentimes not a good thing. Yeah. And it's interesting now not to get too into weeds about, uh, you know, government uh, spending in, in America. But, you know, when when Obama came in, uh, in 2009, he, of course, he won what was, con you know, what was rightly considered a mandate at the time. And the Democrats took they uh, they had control of the House, but they took control of the Senate. He, he did have a blank check for two years and spending went up and they got everything they wanted, basically. And that elected a Republican Congress. And then things started leveling off. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of divided government because it's, you know, at various points, it seems as if, you know, spending just keeps going up anyway. But, um, you know, at least in uh, the late Bush years and the, the second half of Obama, things leveled off a bit because it, it seemed, uh, you know, a divided government put the put the brakes on certain spending. So uh, behind all of these trends is how people view government and how people feel mm -hmm. about society and, and politics and, and so on. And uh, one of the things that we that we see is when you look at the global picture and you see the high point at 2007 and then it, it starts go, going down with the financial crisis, that's a period of time where you, you really see the rise of different forms of populism during, during mm -hmm. this uh, subsequent period of time all over the world, authoritarian populism of the left, of the right, uh, in a lot of countries just taking over, and in a lot of political systems having a bigger say in politics, including in liberal democracies, as, occur as occurred in the United States, I, I would argue, in both parties. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 what happened, I think, in the United States, uh, beginning during the uh, Bush administration, um, which, as I say, had its own crises and, and expanded... Mm -hmm. Uh, the role of government, so it was reducing freedom, is if you look at the at the um, surveys by Pew and by Gallup, you see that over the past 15 to 20 years in the United States, trust in almost every institution in society starts right. coming down, and it's it's hitting record lows on so many different uh, institutions. We're yeah. talking about um, the, the, uh, the media, uh, Congress, right. the executive, uh, the things like the Catholic church and philanthropies are the actually church, also seeing, a, yeah. um, uh, businesses, you know, mm -hmm. big businesses and, and other kinds of businesses. And so when, when there is a loss of trust in the main institutions in society that mediate, uh, interaction in society, uh, you're in Latin American territory and that's when Trump came in. And that's I, I very much view Trump as a Latin American populist, 
Uh, mm-hmm. But I think that he didn't come out of nowhere. Something right. was going on in the United States that led people to think, hey, you know, the rules of the game aren't aren't fair anymore. We don't and, trust this institution or that institution. Yeah. And both he and Hillary Clinton, this was uh, striking to me in the rhetoric in 2016. They both explicitly said the system is broken. You know, they offered different reasons for why it yeah. was broken, what was broken in it and how they would fix it. But it was uh, fairly chilling. And, you know, and I think on some profound level accurate. I mean, certainly yeah. there's a reason why they were the candidates and they were both saying the system is broken. You can't trust the system. The system doesn't care about you. It's not watching out for you. But of course, they, they took no responsibility for that system. Yeah, that no, no, been, of course. Been a part of yeah. it. I think that that's been yeah. a really big problem for for especially for the democrats who um uh have a lot of uh correct uh, gripes about uh re- republicans or or trump uh they themselves have become uh, at least a big part of the the democrats have become uh, more radicalized but they don't mm-hmm. take into account the role that their ideas had and continue to have in creating the political polarization i very much see the, um, the the political polarization in the United States and the and what's going on now as a legacy of Obama and even of, of Bush. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, um, I don't think that there has been a great um, explanation uh, right. so far or analysis of why that has happened. And um, we can come up with a lot of plausible stories that I think can mm-hmm. uh, be compelling. But the fact of the matter is that this polarization and this rise of populisms, either on the left or right or or both, has been going on all around the world in countries that are completely different from one another in terms of wealth, in terms of the uh, political system, in terms of culture. I mean, we're talking about this happening in Mexico and Chile, two very different uh, societies, and in uh, India and in Hungary, and, you know, the the hardening of nationalisms and so on in Russia and in China, Turkey, and in uh, parts of Western Europe where major political parties have become uh, radicalized or include very radical uh, parties as part of their coalitions. Can you talk uh, briefly, I mean, you you study and focus on Latin America in a lot of your work. And, you know, this is one of the most tragic segments of the world or, or areas in the world where it seemed as if Latin America, broadly speaking, had been doing very well or, you know, was moving in the right direction after the end of the Cold War. Um, and, you know, many of the countries, including places like Chile and Argentina, had started to account for the autocratic governments that, you know, had ruled uh, for decades and things like that. And it just seems like, you know, Latin America is back to uh, a kind of large basket case. What went on there and how did COVID um, either exacerbate or, or moderate that decline? Oh, yeah. I mean, COVID made things much worse. I mean, what's happened in in Latin America over the past several years is this, the return of the left the, and not just the the uh, moderate modern left, which had been alternating in power in many countries over the past uh, cu- couple of decades and, and sensibly upholding reasonable policies. I'm talking about the le- return of the populist left. Mm-hmm. And um, that's been uh, a, a huge disappointment. I think that uh, much of it would not have happened if it weren't for COVID upending society and making people feel um, unsafe. And that's when the opportunists, the political opportunities come out of the woodwork. And that happens in every country, but in countries that don't have um, well-established or long-standing institutions and institutional safeguards like the United States uh, has, um, you can wash away all sorts of institutional progress or freedoms uh, very quickly. And I think that that's, um, that's what's happened in, in a lot of Latin America. That there has been progress in the region. It has been positive. And the progress hasn't just been in terms of policies and institutions, in terms of greater freedoms, and, and notably so over the past uh, 20 to 30 years in, in the region, it's been in terms of every indicator of human well-being, some countries much more than, than others. And so 
we have as classical liberals or advocates of liberal democracy a big challenge because it's undeniable that the ideas that we uphold, the policies, the institutions, and the values are indeed what have led to the big increases in lifespans, the drops in human in uh, infant mortality rates, the big access to safe drinking water, the big increases in per capita income in the countries that have most adopted uh, these I ideas. And yet, if success stories like Chile, and Chile is one of the great developing country success stories of, of all time, uh, by any indicator, any objective indicator, uh, the progress it's made just blows away the rest of Latin America. If a country that has had so much success like that by implementing these policies can so easily elect a far left president on the argument that everything that came before was unfair and um, has to be overturned, which was the, the platform, then we have a big challenge uh, because it's not enough to point to facts. We have to appeal to the, 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 the moral argument of a free society and um, we have to appeal to sense of, of justice and then explain that because I think, uh, I think that every country in Latin America has a different explanation. I don't think there's one explanation for the rise of populism and the decline of freedom in, in countries around the world. But I do think that there are sets of factors and they belong, they explain more, particular factors explain more what happened in this country and that country. In Chile, I think the, the role of ideology played a very big role in which the, the, the left um, created a narrative and took over. It had a really a hegemonic position in, in society and all the cultural institutions, the media, the, the universities, the, the even, even businessmen didn't actually defend the achievements of a free society and the pillars of a free society so that in Chile, everybody knew that the country was unfair, that uh, inequality had grown. It hadn't. It had de declined, and Chile is less unequal than most of the, than the average Latin American country now. That the same people are always getting rich, and the, the poor are always at, at that level. That's not. It's one of the most ha has most social mobility in many countries. There's, the narrative was what was informing Chileans, and there weren't enough. And I know the the people in Chile and admire them who are on our side, but there weren't enough of them um, making the moral case for this tremendous progress that uh, Chile had had achieved. So progress is uh, progress um, uh, can can be had uh, incredible progress like uh, that is unprecedented in human history can be had, but nothing uh, we can't be um, deterministic about it. It can be rolled back, particularly if people believe that um, it's on un somehow unfair or that actually things are getting worse in the world and mm -hmm. and if that's the case then we have to roll back the, the the policies and create new ones and make america great again by protectionism or some something right. like that you know so i think that chile has a bit is a um uh it's a, it's a warning story to the united states uh because uh there you you had a an ideology in this case of, of the left that was really informing everything. And um, I, I find that particularly the ideologies of the left are, are more insidious because they present themselves as being somehow morally superior. Whereas um, the ideologies of the far right are ugly on their face. You know, we don't like the foreigners and these guys are bad and these guys are our enemies. And they're the, and the ideology of the left purport to, to uh, be on the side of the, the, the disadvantaged and so on, when in fact um, we know that they're not, and it also leads to, to, to all the problems of the loss of centralization and, and authoritarianism. So I I think we have to, in the United States, also be very uh, watchful of that, uh, because in Chile it snuck up on society, and <laughs> and um, th thankfully the Chileans have rejected a, a radical uh, constitutional overhaul. Now mm -hmm. they're going to start with another one. So I'm not as pessimistic about Chile as I was, um, you know, last year, but it's still uh, going to take a step back. But your, the, your discussion of populism there, you know, makes me think about the question of democracy and like what role does that play in 
secure, either securing or in other cases, undermining freedom? I mean, you, in your report, you kind of say that you, you don't measure democracy as one of the components, but that it's highly correlated with free societies. So what exactly is the relationship between democracy and freedom? Because these populists can kind of harness a democratic energy to then later come in and impose anti-democratic authoritarianism. So how do you view the, the relationship um, as a whole? That's right. So we're not <clears throat> in our in our index, we're not measuring, <clears throat> excuse me, as part of the index political uh, freedom, but we think that's important. Uh, mm -hmm. And and we measure, you know, democracy or political freedom separately in order to look at the relationship between human freedom and political freedom. What we're looking at are are um, are actual indicators of freedom, uh, actual indicators of uh, whether there is or isn't uh, coercion and political freedom is is a mechanism to make decisions about whether the policy should be this or that and the policy could reduce your freedom or it could increase your your freedom what we find is that there is a strong relationship like you said between human freedom and democracy but um, that's just the overall relationship and we've seen uh, I mean the, the Latin America is a good case study of this um, all of the authoritarianisms there uh, in the last couple of decades came in as elected uh, democracies that then proceeded to eliminate freedoms. And uh, for a large part of the time, they were popular. But there weren't the safeguards that we think of when we talk about liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. and, and so when I think about the optimal political regime, I think of liberal democracy, that's limited, limited mm -hmm. power. Uh, and uh, democracy itself is a very uh, much, much broader term. And um, not and, and so I would say most democracies in the world are actually liberal, illiberal democracies uh, that can very easily turn into authoritarian uh, regimes as clearly was the case in Venezuela, clearly is the case in uh, Nicaragua. Um, I think that's happening in El Salvador and in a few other places. I think Mexico is under threat of that occurring. Uh, Mexico is moving strongly in the direction of l less freedom under the populist uh, president there in a way that I think uh, people outside of Mexico, including in Latin America, don't fully appreciate. A kind of uh, inverse example to that to what you're describing there in Latin America, which, which has been just haunting to, and horrifying to me to watch unfold is the situation in Hong Kong. And you use that as a case study yep. in the Human Freedom Index. This is showing Hong Kong's ranking. We've, we've all seen what's happened as China's reasserted, the Chinese government right. has reasserted control over Hong Kong. This is the ranking. Uh, Which essentially know, started in 2000 or, you know, right around there. So... Right. So this is showing, you know, the, the sharp decline in freedom of association and assembly starting around 20, what, I guess, 2015 there. So uh, I, I, and I've got a clip from I covered Hong Kong. I went over there amidst the protests that were happening. I want to play a clip of some of the, the demonstrators and the, the pro-democracy activists talking about what values are important to them, and then get your reaction as to what has happened to Hong Kong and, and what lessons the world should draw from this example of a not very democratic, but fairly liberal society backsliding so quickly. Core values that we are safeguarding are the freedom to speak our minds, to take our political stance, to protest without fear of being prosecuted. 15 years ago, we had a high level of freedom, or freedom of speech in, or in, in various aspects. But now it seems that we can feel uh, Hong Kong becoming more and more like China. In terms of political values, I, I always believe that one of the biggest gaps in Hong Kong and the Beijing government, the emphasis on rule of law, freedom, freedom of speech, human rights. At the moment, I have to say that I'm pretty pessimistic because it's just so difficult 
to stop China from extending the kind of power and control that they wish for. In a way, I think many of us are probably even thinking that what we're trying to do right now is to slow down the change in the wrong direction, preserving whatever we got for one country, two system at the moment. So what, what lessons would you draw from the example of Hong Kong? Well, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that Hong Kong is just a very unique case study. This is a, this is a country that was um, ruled colonially by Great Britain and um, then was handed over in 1997 to, to, to China under the agreement that it would still keep its autonomy and its, its very free market system. Hong Kong has long been number one in terms of economic freedom in our in our measurements. I think that that's that's uh, weakened. Uh, the, the the economic freedom ratings have started to, to weaken, and so that made it a very unusual uh, uh, situation where you had high levels of civil liberties, personal liberties, and economic freedoms, and based on a very strong uh, rule of law, which was part of the uh, uh, British uh, inheritance and and the kinds of policies that that uh, England and Great Britain were implementing of bigger government, more regulation, and so on back home, were not uh, adopted in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong maintained that high level of, of freedom, which is why it, it it became one of the richest places on earth and and has been called appropriately so, kind of a miracle uh, economy. But it didn't have um, political freedom, and that made it very unusual. I think that the the time when Hong Kongers began to call for more and more freedoms was uh, really grew uh, with, with the handover to to Beijing because of course there was inevitably this uncertainty about what would happen and for the first ten or almost 50, ten or fifteen years actually China um, respected that and Hong Kong maintained a, a very high level. Of, of freedom and, and a very strange situation occurred. I, I, I've traveled there a lot. And during that time period, I went and um, there were democracy activists who wanted to promote uh, democracy and have more of a say uh, over their own uh, uh, city. And um, they tended, however, to be more uh, left oriented. So they wanted to impose more regulations on business and minimum wage laws and also, and more welfare benefits and that kind of thing. The kind of thing that is normal <clears throat> in most liberal democracies uh, today, but that really wasn't the case in, in Hong Kong. And it was Beijing that was opposing them at that time to be able to maintain the free market system. This is the Communist mm -hmm. Party in, in China opposing them and the business community which would otherwise be favorable to democracy in Hong Kong, didn't ally uh, with the democracy movement because the democracy movement was vilifying the, the business community. So right. very odd politics occurred in which I think a lot of concepts were being co confused. And I went to the legislative council one day <clears throat> and one of their, the famous uh, pro-democracy ad advocates was there. The legislative council is their their form of, of, of little Congress with limited powers. Uh, this guy was called Longhair. That was his nickname. <clears throat> and he was on the floor of the Legislative Council wearing, advocating for more democracy and wearing a Che Guevara t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And he's an enemy of the Communist Party in China, who at that time was <laughs> supporting the free market system. So it's kind of a, a funny thing. All of that changed uh, when Xi Jinping came to power. So what we see in Hong Kong today is really a reflection <clears throat> of his um, power grab in China and his rollback of the freedoms that China had been increasing and ma maintaining for the last several decades and which is responsible for the absolute transformation of China and ma making it a much richer uh, and dynamic country. He's rolling that back. And, and um, that's what he's doing in Hong Kong as well. And that uh, start, and you can see that happening on the graph of, uh, of Hong Kong around 2014. It just starts to, to go down and then, and then more and more steadily. And then, uh, of course, in the year 2020, they passed the, uh, the national security law in Beijing, which eff mm -hmm. effectively took away uh, Hong Kong's uh, autonomy and reduced its, its freedoms and changed the whole system.
Do you think in China now, and there are reports that you know, mainland China now has a lower economic growth rate than most Asian countries, pretty much for the first time in the past 20 or 25 years. Um, is that going to, you know, and, and China certainly had a very brutal uh, repressive regime related to COVID. Uh, you know, this was, you know, in, in, in many cases, this was the first time people in the West started taking COVID seriously when you saw the footage of, you know, people being, uh, you know, uh, nailed into their apartments and things like that so they couldn't move because they were suspected of or, or, ha or had COVID. Um, do you think that the economic slump of China will work to undermine, um, you know, the support or, uh, you know, uh, for uh, Xi's regime? Uh, if, you know, and, and I guess I'm going back to it's a haunting question that or you know, uh, kind of paradox that you brought up that in a place like Chile, you have rising prosperity, but the narrative is that things are getting worse and worse. And that has actual political effect in a place like China, much more authoritarian country. But if people are actually falling behind, you know, the, the growth rates have slowed down, their growth rates relative to other countries around them are slowing down. Will that uh, you know, will that have positive effects on pushing for for increased freedom in China? Well, I, <clears throat> the <clears throat> Xi Jinping is already losing uh, popularity because of the measures that they took during COVID. But yeah. I'm afraid that uh, it's still not going to be enough uh, because mm -hmm. it already is a totalitarian regime. They have a tremendous amount of police power and, and control mm -hmm. <clears throat> in a way that... Um, wasn't the case uh, at the beginning of his uh, 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 of when he came to power, and he's just been extending that. He's China is basically facing um, the dictator's dilemma, which is that as a poor and authoritarian regime liberalizes economically and grows uh, uh, e economically, which is certainly what what China ha has done people by definition are more free and more prosperous. I mean, you, you the control of the economy is the control of life itself. So when you liberalize, right. you have more, more freedom. And then people are more independent of the state and also are going to want more of their other right. kinds. Of and freedom. this we should point out also is, you know, Milton Friedman talked about this uh, in, you know, things like free to choose and whatnot. But in the 80s, as uh, once the economy in China was liberalized post Mao, um, you know, at the end of the decade, you saw the uh, democracy movement uh, most spectacularly in Tiananmen Square. Friedman was saying, you know, like, once again, I'm proven right. When you get economic freedom, people get rich, wealthier people start to demand political freedom. Here we go. And of course, it didn't quite work out that way. Well, but I think <clears throat> there's no question that the Chinese uh, are more, even today, are much, much freer than they were in 1980. Right and yeah. certainly richer and so on. What Xi Jinping is doing is that he's realizing that if he keeps going in the direction of liberalization and uh, the growth that it, that it, it produces, uh, the Communist Party is gonna lose control because mm -hmm. it's, it's by definition. That's the process that all sorts of authoritarian regimes that have liberalized economically have gone through and that eventually ending up with political freedoms and democracy. Mm -hmm. Chile did it, Mexico did it, Taiwan, South Korea, and so on and so forth. And he doesn't want to lose control. So what he's doing is he's rolling back those freedoms, but that has a cost. The cost right. is economic growth. The cost is civil unrest. And nobody knows what's going to happen. I think that China is essentially an ungovernable country, but mm -hmm. it has become more totalitarian. <clears throat> and um, that's the problem. I think that, that there's going to be very hard times in, in China, and it's it's not clear what direction it'll go. Uh, but I'm hopeful that it will that it will remain an essentially ungovernable country, and maybe right. that'll open up some spaces for for change. How do the economic? How do you think the economic and either political or social freedoms? work in concert in the other direction? Because I was thinking back to the example of the United States with this, if we pull up this slide again of the different freedom indicators, we've got, you know, we're sliding on things like rule of law and size of government, but then you go down to like personal relationships, mm -hmm. which would include same-sex marriages, you know, ability to divorce, uh, 
women's, uh, you know, equal rights and relationships, that we're at a, a perfect 10 there. Um, are these things just kind of, is there a, a cleavage happening there? Uh, or does one kind of tend to, in a delayed fashion, follow the other if we look at other examples around the world? Well, <clears throat> one thing that we find, remember that th this is a 30,000 foot view of each of each country and of freedoms in general. Um, one thing that we find is that there's a strong relationship be between economic freedom and personal freedoms. I like to tell people who who appreciate personal freedoms that if you want to live in a country with a high level of personal freedom, you better pick a country with a relatively high level of economic freedom because mm -hmm. the two go hand in hand. And we know that there's plenty of human rights advocates or advocates of freedom of the press or people who have uh, good intentions to promote certain freedoms that uh, don't fully appreciate economic freedom or or even hostile to it. And so this is a that's an important finding, empirical finding that comes out of this study. But um, I don't think that that uh, we can say w that there's a, this regularity when this goes up, this other thing goes down um, in three years or with a two year lag. It's not as simple as that. I mean, I think that in the United States, as we've seen, both personal and economic freedoms have have gone down. Um, but you're right. There are things like um, uh, relationship I issues that are much better now than they were 10 years ago, and notably so. Mm -hmm. I think that this is something that we don't measure because there's not uh, reliable international uh, comparable data, uh, but drug drug prohibition or drug freedom, I think that has improved in the United States, not as much as we, we might like. Um, so that's an improvement. But uh, other things like um, freedom of expression, I think, are have become more problematic in the United States. Mm -hmm. Even if the First Amendment is still strong, we have cultural issues, and th that's important, of freedom of expression uh, and um, and you want to maintain a, a, a culture that is supportive of freedom of expression or more broadly yeah. speak tolerance rather than intolerance of, of various different views and, and lifestyles. And I think that that's, that's, a, that's a big problem for a free society. And um, we, we're still uh, in the United States um, wrestling with that. Yeah, can I um, also just uh, to kind of expand a little bit on what what counts as economic freedom? One of the things that, particularly for American libertarians, is that we assume all of Europe is somehow you know a left wing haven and whatnot. And again, I mean, both uh, your economic rankings as well as uh, you know the Heritage Foundation and Simon Fra Simon Fraser University, you find reliably countries like Sweden. Um, uh, you know, having a higher rate of economic freedom on these indices. And, and you know, whereas everybody's like Sweden is a socialist paradise. Could you talk a little bit about what are the economic freedom uh, indicators that really, um, that ultimately matter in terms of, you know, human freedom? Um, because it's not simply what the top, mar top marginal tax rate is, right? Um, what, what goes into that? You know, that's a that's a tough question. I mean, when we when we measure economic freedom, we're measuring size of government, the, the rule of law, we're measuring right. uh, sound money and regulation and, and trade. Those are the broad the, the mm -hmm. broad areas. And, you know, we've some years ago, I asked uh, Jim Gwartney and the authors of the economic mm -hmm. freedom, what what do they think are what really uh, is critical? Yeah. I, I think that at different stages of development, you might have different answers. Right. Mm -hmm. But. Um, one of the things that 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 we found was that if a country doesn't improve its uh, rule of law indicator above uh, a certain level, it doesn't tend to improve in other areas very much or uh, uh, grow as much as countries that continue to improve uh, mm -hmm. in that area. So I think that the that the legal system, that the rule of law indicators are are, are critical, uh, especially as a country is developing. And, it, you know, you have countries like Sweden, like France, like, you know, your Western European countries, the United States, too, that has a long tradition of a sound uh, rule of law. It came right. out of 800 years of, of building yep. that up 
Uh, and uh, developing countries don't don't have that. Um, that is what uh, that and, and, and limited government historically is what led to uh, the, 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 the rich world becoming rich. It also allowed uh, government the size of government to increase. And, and and I think that that's a decrease in, in economic freedom, but it's the kind of thing that can happen in a country that has sound institutions that lead to, to wealth. And then you can make what I would call a mistake and not pay for it in the same way that is true of developing countries that don't have that institutional basis. And when they make mistakes, um, it, it costs them more because they're poor and it has a bigger a bigger cost. So comparing Sweden with with the United States, Sweden has higher taxes and a bigger right. welfare welfare state. But you know, it's also a, a relatively free uh, free trade country. Uh, its regulations yeah. are not that that high. It has things um, like many European countries that are freer, school choice. Mm -hmm. um, no minimum wage, things like that. That yeah. Here. So the the labor regulations, not not counting minimum wage, it's much harder to fire somebody in Sweden, but it's much easier to run a business otherwise. And I think you know one of the Achilles heels or, or maybe blind spots of the American libertarian movement has been that it you know it doesn't do nuance very well. It just looks <laughs> at the percentage of government spending, you know, as, as a as an expression of GDP. And if it's bigger, then it's worse. Uh, and it's not always that case. And and I know Zach is going to ask you a final question. Um, but before we get to that, you had talked about you know the decline in trust and confidence in institutions in the United States. And if you go back, uh, uh, you know, both in the book that I wrote with Matt Welch, the Declaration of Independence, and in a story I think in 2019, I talked a lot about that. This has become a, a it started becoming a fixation of mine in the Bush years because the decline in trust and the confidence of government and you know virtually every aspect of society just became so apparent. And if you go back to Gallup and a couple of other polling services, it really starts in the late 60s and the early 70s for absolutely good reasons. A lot of businesses, but especially government, you know, and especially the federal government has just lied and cheated and done poorly and not owned up to its mistakes, not tried to fix it. The question between the hollowing out of trust and confidence in government and other institutions, what is the contribution do you think that libertarian rhetoric has made over you know the past half century um, or so? Because the argument that libertarians always make is that government or an increasing number of people within the libertarian movement say government is always incompetent. You know, at best it's incompetent. At worst, it's actually malevolent and it, and it has evil intent. We hear that again and again. Reagan, you know, very famously and successfully co-opted libertarian rhetoric when he said, you know, the government isn't the answer to your problems. Government is the problem. Um, do libertarians, do you think, and, you know, you brought, you used the term at one point classical liberal, um, you know, do libertarians need to do a better job of kind of sussing out what is the legitimate role of government and what are the legitimate functions versus this blanket condemnation, which very much goes to complaints, you know, that lead to populism, that government is corrupt, government is evil, government is inefficient, et cetera. Probably so. I think that the term size of government has been misused a lot to, to only mean how much government spends. And mm -hmm. um, the contribution of libertarians, I think, is to have a proper skepticism of power. That's what you saw in the, in the 1960s and so on. And I think that that was mm -hmm. a healthy thing. Um, Absolutely. Whereas the kinds of... Um, fall and trust that I think we've been seeing now has been... Uh, uh, a skepticism of institutions themselves, almost that this is my own particular read of mm -hmm. things, um, and you know, throw throw it all out. We can't trust any of it, and mm -hmm. I think maybe that's that's grounded in in something, uh, right. and that something is what we as libertarians have to get a hold of. I think that the the mm -hmm. the right way to talk about things is the proper role of government. Um, people think. Um, the size of government is too big, and it turns off some people because um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean, um, imply 
Um, I don't know. I, I think that the economists among libertarians have mostly made that argument. And mm -hmm. while I think it's correct, it doesn't really capture everything. And, it, and most people don't think in those terms to begin with. And so mm -hmm. you want to, I think, talk more about the proper role of government. And I think that we need to um, ask ourselves why in the last 15, 20 years in the United States, we've seen this decline in, in trust. How is it different than in other mm -hmm. times? And I don't feel like um, many people are asking that question well enough, or answering that question well enough. And I think mm -hmm. that gover that libertarians probably have a, can have a better insight into that. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. Yeah. So the the if if the proper role of government is at least in in my mind to protect these freedoms that you are trying to measure, um, it does. It, I, I want to. It, return to that question i actually have two final wrap-ups but they're they're related <laughs> and the the first the first is um that question of what is freedom what is this freedom that is worth protecting um and you laid out that there's a lot of different different definitions of freedom and you are focused on one very specific definition why could you just make the case for why that is the proper definition uh, or, or why that is the thing that we should be focused on increasing uh, in countries around the world. And, and by the way, the definition, um, am I right to say that it's uh, fundamentally it's freedom from coercion? That's right. Okay. And um, I think, you know, not everybody has to agree with that. And indeed, not everybody does. Some people just totally disagree with that. But I think that the, it does appeal to a lot of people to be the author of their own lives. And it does have a, a, an appeal to people to say people should have the right to express the, their conscience, to talk mm -hmm. about th uh, what they think, uh, as long as they're not harming somebody, to worship in the way that they want, as long as it's not harming somebody. And so there's an inherent value. The first and most important reason to use that um, uh, as a definition is because there's an inherent value. And even if you are the type of person that believes in all sorts of other freedoms, positive freedoms, like the right to have a house and that kind of thing, which I don't really think are true rights. Um, most of those people, even though they're in contradiction, also believe in freedom of expression and these other freedoms. And so I think that it, it has as wide appeal as you can, can get uh, with people. But beyond that, we also know that freedom plays a central role in human progress we can see the the relationship uh the strong relationship between freedom and prosperity and indicators of human well-being across the board and that's important to point out as well so when um <clears throat> when countries uh have less freedom they just don't have as as high high a standard of living as the countries that have high freedoms one of the things that we've noticed in this era of globalization though is that there's been a tremendous improvement in human well-being all around the world that's that's a that is a huge triumph of, of classical liberalism because we're talking about a world that has become more free, uh, not just uh, within countries but globally. And one of the the worrisome aspects of the United States loss in freedom is the following: when you look at countries that are less free, even in those countries, even in countries that have that haven't done much to improve their freedom, you see notable improvements in human well-being. What is literally happening is that the free countries are lifting up all of humanity because in the poorest countries, you see people using cell phones, taking medicines that are invented in, in free countries, benefiting from capital that comes in from free countries. The freedom of the free benefits not only the free, it benefits everybody, as Hayek observed more than 50 years ago. And I think that uh, this is a, a good example of that. And so that's one more reason why the loss of freedom in the United States is really bad news, not just for Americans, but for the world. I would, you know, not to launch us into a, a six hour conversation about this, but it, with the mention of Hayek, I think it's worth thinking about. I, I agree fundamentally that freedom from coercion is a fundamental, perhaps the fundamental part of any definition of freedom. But Hayek in books like The Constitution of Liberty and elsewhere also Talk not quite in terms of positive rights, that you have a right to a house, you have a right to a job, but that he believed in a social welfare state 
uh, that oftentimes I find in conversations with most people who call themselves <clears throat> libertarian would say any transfer payment is not just ineffective and inefficient, but is immoral. And it's interesting because Hayek, as a classical liberal, did not believe that. He supported a social welfare state. And that one measure of freedom, and I don't know how you do this without, you know, just opening up like an endless, you know, uh, uh, expansion of this, but that if you don't have, uh, you know, if you don't have the ability or the freedom to participate in society because you are born poor and there is no education offered you, or, you know, you you grow up in certain cir circumstances that, you know, negative, negative freedoms don't quite get to a flourishing society um, that is going to continue to grow. But. Yeah, so there is uh, an argument for some base uh, level yeah. of, of, of helping out the, the, the less fortunate, um, but, you know, we're so far away from that world with the massive mm -hmm. welfare states and the dysfunctionality of, of big government that I'm yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. happy to have that discussion when we when we actually have to, <laughs> to, to deal with that uh, sure. reality. Instead, I think that what, what we have is a situation where libertarians point to this move toward greater freedom in many countries around the world, and including in the United States up until the year 2000 right. or whatever. Um, but there needs to be probably a lot more drilling down because um, most people in their lives are not assessing every single aspect of freedom and weighing it on the same right. uh, scale. Um, maybe what's happened in the United States is that some things that um, didn't used to be political are much more politically decided today, even if monetary mm -hmm. policy is better uh, than 30 years ago. And so much more is at stake with the political system that affects mm -hmm. people's lives than used to be the case. And maybe that's what people are reacting to. I heard Mark and and I think it was him say, um, you know, all these things are, are, are becoming better. But if you look at um, housing and education and healthcare, um, even though everything else has seen prices drop, those prices right. have skyrocketed. Of course, that's where government is more involved, but people, right. that's where, that's the American dream, right? You but it's also and, true. I mean, this is where, you hmm. know, it's also true that housing is better. Healthcare yes, is no, better. I, I mean, it's I, much I, more expensive, you, you, but it's also that's actually right. increased, right? That, that's that's right, too. Um, I don't know about like education. I don't know about I, You know, one of the other things that is interesting, and you see this, at, you know, uh, Zach, you had shown that side of Texas, uh, you see this in Texas and Florida, which are the two, you know, most successful large population states of the past 20 years, really probably the past 50 years. But in each of them, uh, because of COVID or partly under the auspices of COVID, you've also seen a shift at what level do political decisions get made? Uh, they are much more likely to be made at the state house or in the governor's mansion rather than in the local school district uh, or, or like that local businesses can't decide certain things. We saw this again and again, and that's an interesting wrinkle in, you know, in, in kind of levels of freedom in, in America. You know, I, I think everybody would probably agree that Texas and Florida compared to say California and New York are much more free uh, states, certainly economically, and and their economies kind of reflect that. They're growing. That's where people are moving. And yet at the same level, we're starting to see the governors assert that I have the right to say what books are taught or what, what the curriculum is everywhere, uh, what businesses can and can't do, what masking policy uh, things. You know, it, it, it's an interesting question to ask. I, I don't think we'll um, have the time to get into it, but you know, in the wake of COVID, what are the long tail kind of shifts that may end up re, you know, kind of uh, recentering American politics and particularly what counts as a conservative uh, you know, way of governing versus a, a liberal one? Uh, you know, 20 years ago, certainly uh, conservatives were all about local control. Uh, you know, and certainly when Barry Goldwater was running for president in 64, it's all about, oh, no, let the states decide, let uh, subgroups within the state decide things. And now, uh, you know, interestingly, we see, um, you know, in these conservative Republican states, governors saying, no, no, it, I get to decide. Yeah, that, that, that brings me to like what I would hope that you could reflect on last, which is the effects, the political effects that 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 we talked about at the beginning 
of the ending, the end of this national emergency. What, uh, because when I think about it, you know, that th yes, there has been this shift among, um, you know, conservative red state governors. To, it's it's a kind of weird mixture of both using federalism to fight uh, for more liberty in states, but then also uh, kind of a, an increased willingness to impose an ideology using state power versus the, the woke corporations and, and all that. But I, I guess what what I'm when when I look back and and this your your study looks at 2020, which is kind of you know the depths of the pandemic. We'll see what happens when you measure 2021 and 2022. My suspicion would be in some ways like we're going to come out. It it came out of that slump, but there are things that have lingered. And so, is there? I, my biggest worry is that we have this we had this national emergency and it's maybe primed the population and the systems to accept future emergencies for other things. The flip side of that is that I think it's awakened in a lot of people an appreciation for freedom that maybe wasn't there before because then having to live under this sudden state of, of unfreedom what where do you fall along that spectrum? Are you optimistic uh, that we are going to reverse these trends here in the US? are Are you pessimistic or or is there some mixture? That's a good question. Um, I think certainly we're not as free today as we were in January of twenty twenty. The question you're really asking is at what level, how how much uh, will we have recovered and which trajectory are we going to go? I think that in economic freedom, we're going in the wrong direction. Um, we can probably expect that to continue. Um, one of the I'll say one of the things that I said at the beginning of this conversation, which is that uh, COVID really did accelerate a lot of the trends that were already happening in the United States. And um when you have a situation where people are literally fearing for their lives and seeing that the government is not actually doing a good job at um, securing that, you know, that does create incentives uh, to give more power to the to the strong man, to the guy that, you know, screw these institutions. We're just going to do right. this and it'll be done in an arbitrary fashion, which is what what happened to a large extent. So, um, you know. The politics of the United States has been transformed in the last several years. The Republican Party is totally different than it was just a few, just several years ago. For that matter, so is the Democratic yep. Party. And I think that we're going to recover freedom of movement. We've already done that mo mostly. We're going to rec recover freedom of assembly and association. We've done that uh, mostly. Freedom of expression, I think that's still going to be um, going to be a tough uh, issue. Um, rule of law, I think that's still going to be a, a, a tough issue, but there, there will be a, a recovery. And um, I don't want to give any prediction because I tend to be an optimist. Um, mm -hmm. But right now, things aren't, even though they're recovering, they're not pointing in the great long-term direction. But I do feel like there's also a backlash against the, uh, this excessive uh, power, uh, which is one of the great things about this country. That's a great place to leave it. Thank you very much, uh, Ian Vasquez, Nick Gillespie, our producer, Adam Sullivan, and all of you who tuned in. We will see you again next Thursday. Thank Thanks. you.